Lakayla, thank you for sharing your story. Um, just one person having experienced that is certainly enough. Um, but Lakayla is certainly no anomaly, as this is an all too familiar story uh, for too many people. But thank you for sharing what was uh, deeply personal. It's not easy to do what you just did. And so we thank you. And of course, it's always good to stand alongside my partners in good trouble um, in doing the work of righting wrongs and centering the humanity of people in our efforts around consumer protection and social justice and so many other issues. Today, we're all here to call on President Biden to do right by the movement that elected him and to use his executive authority to cancel $50,000 in federal student loan debt. We find ourselves in a moment of crises, a public health and economic crises, which has ravaged communities in the Massachusetts 7th and all across our Commonwealth, a crisis of racial injustice and white supremacy, which continues to inflict hurt and harm and trauma on black, brown, AAPI, and indigenous folks nationwide and a growing student debt crisis which disproportionately impacts black and brown borrowers. So what this moment calls for is that we are bold and that we are intentional in our policymaking at every level of government to confront these overlapping crises head on and to set ourselves on a pathway to a just and equitable recovery. Now make no mistake, very often on the issue of student debt, there has only been one narrative that people have heard. And that narrative does a, a deep disservice and injustice to the totality of burden and hurt and the psychological toll and impact of this debt. The student debt crisis has always been a racial and economic justice issue. But for too long, that narrative has excluded Black and Latinx communities when in fact, the student debt crisis has exacerbated deeply entrenched racial and economic inequities in our nation. Because of discriminatory policies like redlining, Black families were denied the ability to build generational wealth. 85% of Black students feel, or not even feel, it is the reality that they have no choice but to take out student loans and they are five times more likely to default um, than their counterparts, than their other peers. So these disparities, they didn't just magically appear. They are the direct result of generations of precise intentional policy violence, is how I would characterize it, which has systemically denied black and Latinx families the opportunity to build wealth and forced our families to take on higher rates of student debt for the chance at the same degree as our white counterparts. We have got to take bold action to address these inequities and disparities in our country, and we must use every tool available to provide our communities with the critical relief they so desperately need and deserve. Canceling student debt by executive action is one of the most effective ways President Biden can provide sweeping relief to millions of families, help reduce the racial wealth gap, and begin to build the groundwork for an equitable and just long-term recovery. So if President Biden is serious about closing the racial wealth gap, if President Biden seeks to build back better, then he must use his executive authority to issue broad based across the board student debt cancellation. We cannot afford to make the same mistakes of the past. During the 2008 financial crisis, lawmakers bailed out Wall Street and abandoned black and brown communities who lost everything and many have yet to recover. So as we work to ensure an equitable recovery to the current crisis, we can't simply tinker around the edges. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts alone, there are over 855,000 student borrowers and they owe a total of $33.3 billion in student loan debt. Their average student loan balance is nearly $39,000. So that means in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic, which has wrought unprecedented economic hardship, food insecurity, unemployment, families on the precipice of eviction, 
that people are still being expected to pay student loan debt that is the equivalent of a mortgage in the midst of a global pandemic when they're having to fight and do every little thing just to remain safely housed in the midst of a global pandemic. I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District. This is a vibrant, diverse, dynamic district, and it is one of the most unequal in our country. So while student debt cancellation would help communities nationwide, it would have an especially profound and transformative impact here in our Commonwealth. As lawmakers, we have a responsibility to ensure that our long-term recovery efforts leave no community behind. And that's why we're all here today. This is about investing in the people. That's what student debt cancellation is. It's good economic policy. It's an investment in the people, particularly black and brown families. And that's why Senator Warren and I, in partnership with Senate Majority Leader Schumer and our other colleagues, reintroduced our resolution in Congress that calls on President Biden to cancel up to $50,000 in student loan debt and lays out a pathway for him to do so. Our resolution has a record level of support across both chambers of Congress and is supported by over 325 grassroots organizations. The coalition behind student debt cancellation is the very same coalition that elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And it is a powerful coalition. With the stroke of a pen, President Biden can provide direct relief to tens of millions of families across the country, help close the racial wealth gap, and set our nation on a path to a long-term equitable recovery. He can and must use this authority. Before I close, I'd like to thank uh, once again, Attorney General Healy for her partnership on this and so many other issues for generously hosting us all here this afternoon. And, and again, I thank her for her leadership and all that she has done on the state level to ensure the students are not ripped off by predatory for-profit colleges and get the critical relief uh, that they deserve. And now I'd like to introduce again, my partner in good trouble, um, who speaks my love language, which is policy, uh, our Senator Elizabeth Warren. Maybe we should have some transition music. That's all right. <laughs> Bear That's with right. me here. There's a little dance. Got to get this mask over my hoops. Bear with me. Okay. I noticed you managed. <laughs> I know. It's become skilled now. I'm skilled. Very nice. Okay. Thank I'm you. good. <laughs> right. I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it is good to be here today with all of you. Uh, LaKayla, I want to start by saying thank you so much for telling your story. Uh, because we are here about stories of millions of people across this country who have a story that may not be identical to LaKayla's, but it resonates with it. People who took out student loan debt because they were trying to do their best, they were trying to get an education, and who, through one move or another, are now caught in a debt nightmare. We are calling on President Joe Biden to end that nightmare. We are calling on him for justice. I am so glad to be here today with Attorney General Healy. As she rightly pointed out when we started, this is not our first time to come in here to talk about student loan debt and to fight back on behalf of people who've been tricked, trapped, and smashed by student loan outfits that have cheated them. Um, it is not our first time to come in and talk about the overwhelming debt loads that young people are dealing with today. And I'm glad to be here again, but I have to say it's time for real action so that we can get this done and move to other issues. I also want to say a very special thank you uh, to my partner, um, my co-conspirator uh, in so many efforts on behalf of justice across the Commonwealth and across the nation. Ayanna Presley has been a fighter on the student loan issue from the very beginning. And she brings a strength and a moral clarity to it that convinces me, three tough women, we're gonna get this done. Um, four. Four, <laughs> you're exactly right. I was thinking of those of us who had official roles in this. It's four and it's millions more. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we're here today to call on President Biden for justice. Canceling $50,000 of student loan debt 
is a matter of racial justice. It is a matter of economic justice. It is a matter of generational justice. On racial justice, canceling $50,000 of student loan debt would close the black white wealth gap in America for those who have student loan debt by 25 points. There is no other single action that the President of the United States could take to help close that gap, to help bring families together, to help lift up families who generation after generation have been left behind in the effort to build real wealth and wealth across generations. Um, it is a matter of economic justice. Canceling $50,000 of student loan debt is a matter of acknowledging that people who have tried to get an education and end up with student loan debt are disproportionately those who come from families that can't afford to write a check for college. 40% of the people who are dealing with student loan debt were not able to finish college. They had babies, they had three jobs, uh, the transportation fell through, life happened. And they find themselves in jobs now that pay the way a job does for someone with a high school diploma, but struggling to deal with student loan debt. Young people today increasingly cannot start small businesses if they have student loan debt. So here we are at a moment in our economy as we're trying to come out of this pandemic when so many small businesses have closed, when so many small businesses are struggling, a time when a new generation could come in and open up those businesses, open up those restaurants. And if you don't have student loan debt, you got a chance to do that. But for those who are already dealing with a monthly payment that has to be made month after month after month, that means the opportunity to start a business is just not there for them. And this is something that we were seeing even before the pandemic. So the Federal Reserve had tracked the data that show that new business formation is being held back by student loan debt. Same thing is true on buying homes. Uh, people are not able to buy homes if they are dealing with a student loan debt burden. So if we wanna give everyone in this country opportunity, that starts with letting them get an education without getting crushed by student loan debt. And we start on that by canceling a big chunk of the student loan debt that is out there. And the third, this is a matter of generational justice. You know, I, I have people say to me, people who are my age, who say, well, I went through college, worked part-time job, and I didn't have to take on any student loan debt. True, because you had alternatives to get a college degree without going deep into debt. I went to a state school that cost $50 a semester for a price I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job. I could finish a four-year diploma and become a special needs teacher. That opportunity is simply not out there today. For young people who are trying to get an education, Unless they come from a family that can afford to write a check for tuition, it means debt. That is not how we build a future. We need to invest in the people who are struggling with student loan debt today. And the best way we can invest in them is cancel $50,000 of student loan debt. We're here today to ask President Biden, please listen to the people across this country who need your help. Listen to those who want to build a stronger America going forward. Cancel student loan debt and give them the chance to do that. Thank you all. And I think we'll take some questions. I'll clean up here. We'll take questions from the Zoom here first. Um, and I'll ask the response to repeat the questions so folks on the Zoom can hear. Anyone here? Come next to you, LaKayla. There we are. I'm nowhere an expert on this issue, but does canceling up to fifty thousand dollars does that uh, further the advantages of folks who maybe went to more expensive schools, more prestigious schools, maybe have those jobs that are higher wage earners? 
So canceling student loan debt, canceling $50,000 worth of student loan debt will wipe out student loan debt for about 85% of all those who are carrying, currently carrying student loan debt. Um, one of the, the problems we have right now with student loan debt, it, it's, it's affected so many people across such a range that people like LaKayla may have $27,000 worth of student loan debt, but that is enough to keep you from buying a home. It may be enough to keep you from starting a small business. It may be enough to ruin your credit, enough to hold people back. Um, so the we when we looked at all the numbers around student loan debt, what we discovered is that what $50,000 will do is it will help close the racial wealth gap and it will free up many of those who were not able to graduate from college from having any debt so that they are free and clear. And then for those who have even more debt, it, it puts them ahead so they'll be able to pay down. I probably should have added, this may be helpful on your question. I'm not quite sure if I'm getting all the parts of your question. Two out of every three people who goes to a state school today has to borrow money in order to graduate. So student loan debt is hitting the people who are trying to find an education uh, that they can afford, but they just can't manage it. And yeah, I would whatever. Just, I would just add, yeah. I mean, right. Again, we do a, a disservice when we uh, perpetuate the idea that um, this is a that the face of student debt are um, white graduate students uh, who went to Ivy League institutions. Um, that is not the story of student debt. In fact, this is not even just a millennial or Gen Z issue. The fastest growing population of those who owe student debt are 50 plus. In my district, as I have traveled it, uh, seeking to, to actively hear these stories and to better understand um, how to address this nearly $2 trillion crisis, I want you to know that I have had people as old as 76 years old who have told me they are still paying student debt. And, and that doesn't even include the educators, some of which um, more generally, Attorney General Healy was speaking about, who have lost their licensure to teach because they've defaulted on loans, loans that they took on because they wanted to be of service to their community. And let us not forget that under the prior administration during this pandemic until we intervened, 54,000 people had wages and benefits garnished because of defaulted student loans. So I hope by enumerating you know, those examples there, it makes plain um, that this is a, that the hurt is deep and it is wide. Um, and again, it is an economic justice issue. It is a racial justice issue. And, I, and I'll pick up on the words of our, of our good Senator there. It is a generational issue, but, but please know that uh, this is not just a millennial or Gen Z issue. And we do a disservice to the issue when we define it simply by um, having the institution that you went to. Cause that also leaves out uh, those that have been adversely impacted by the predatory business practices um, and deceptive marketing of for-profit colleges and universities. So. Uh, I have a question. How did you get to the 50,000 or yeah, $50,000 figure? There have been different figures thrown around on this issue. I just want to know how you landed. Do you want me to do yeah, that yeah. one? Yeah, you did this. So uh, we looked at the data uh, and uh, it's a, a uh, how much people owe, how long they've owed it, how old they are. And what we discovered is that $10,000 is just not enough help for enough people. Uh, that um, 50,000 helped us reach the point where we could cancel all debt for about 85% of those carrying student loan debt and help close the racial wealth gap uh, the most. So it's a, it's a place where it's a, it's a substantial amount of debt relief um, and uh, works best for being able to help the maximum number of people get back on their feet. Um, I think what about the, uh, you mentioned that 85% of those who now have debt uh -huh. will be taken care of under this bill. Uh -huh under this uh, proposal. What do you say to the 15% who wouldn't be included? 
And what do you say to all of those who have paid off their debt? Well, let, let's they, do. They, they paid off their mm -hmm. debt, and now they're seeing other people get off without mm -hmm. paying it. Right. And what message does this send to all future students who take on debt? Doesn't it send a message that you're not going to really have to pay this off because we'll, we'll let you walk away from it? So let me start with the first part of your question. If I leave any part out, you can remind me. But on the 15%, many of these are higher income. Um, uh, uh, someone who's a plastic surgeon, for example, may have taken out a lot of student loan debt, but has a lot of capacity to repay the student loan debt. For those who don't, uh, going through bankruptcy and changing the rules in the Department of Education, so that they can cancel student loan debt as part of the bankruptcy process if they show that they are otherwise unable to pay, uh, permits a more um, handcrafted approach for the smaller number of people who have very high debt loads and very low incomes. On the question about people who've already paid off their student loan debt, my answer is this is good for you. Student loan debt is holding back our economy. Our economy would do better if all of the people who have student loan debt were able to get out and start their own small businesses, able to buy homes, able to take jobs in public service, things that are denied to them when they're struggling with a load of debt. So overall, it's like everything else we do. I invest in public roads in South Dakota. I don't drive on them. But I invest in them because I understand that having an interstate highway system is part of how we make this country work for everyone. We try to create opportunity for everyone. And that ultimately, that investment is what redounds to the benefit of everyone. The second part I'd say about that is that if we're going to take the position that if I didn't already get it in the past, you can't get it now, We'd never build anything. We wouldn't have started Social Security. We wouldn't have started Medicare. The whole notion is we're trying to move in that direction where young people can get an education without actually putting their entire future on the line, without, as Congresswoman Presley said, having to pay one full mortgage before they're dead flat broke and can start trying to build up some wealth to buy a home and, and save for their retirements. We're trying to move in that direction. Canceling student loan debt is the first step. The second step is making college debt free for any student who wants it. And, and I would just add, I'm Please. sorry, I would just add to that. Um, I serve on the Financial Services Committee and actually in the last Congress, uh, my bill did pass the House. I'll yes. be reintroducing it. Um, and that's the Comprehensive uh, Credit Recovery Act. So I think that, you know, there's three ways holistically that we get it. We get at this for those who have already defaulted on loans and that's impacted their credit score. We make it easier for them to to um, to rehab their credit. And then to Senator Warren's point that the ultimate goal is um that people are able to pursue higher education, to invest themselves, to better themselves, um, and it is debt free. And, um, you know, finally, uh, I mentioned that we have educators in the district who lost their licensure to teach. That's not about a lack of personal responsibility. If we, if you have a situation um, where you are required to have city residency in order to teach in, the, in, in a Boston public school and our housing is unaffordable and you're paying more than 70% of your income, you know, for rent. I mean, so there's, you have to look at the issue uh, holistically. Um, I don't think those teachers were operating in an irresponsible uh, manner. We haven't created an ecosystem whereby um, they can be of service uh, to community. They took out these loans in order to be of service to community and, uh, and they've lost their licensure to teach uh, because of it, because of all the other expenses. And Mike, I just, I think the, the question you're getting at too is fairness, right? Line drawing, right? I, I understand that. I think my response is we don't have a choice. We've reached this point. Student loan debt in this country is the fastest form of debt. You know, $1.7, $1.9 trillion and growing. Three years ago, I called Jim Rooney, head of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. We got together and we put forth a task force on this issue. And why? 
because you don't have people who have any savings. You don't have people who who are looking to buy homes or buy cars, you know, or start businesses. There's an economic imperative that we collectively benefit from. So that's the first thing. Okay. I understand line drawing is always difficult if you're on the other side of the line, but here's where I think you got to take the big picture view. And I don't know how anyone you know, in this moment, and in this moment we, we are so focused on, on, on the, the, the reckoning of, of the racial disparities that have persisted for 400 years, not to zoom out a little and listen to Congresswoman Presley's numbers about who we're really talking about, who's been disproportionately taken advantage of, because we see it every day. We know, you know, from our lines, who's calling in, who's been ripped off by loan servicers, who's been preyed upon by for-profit schools, you know. Look, I went to one of those elite schools, right? I'm a kid. I grew up in New Hampshire. I was able to, you know, figure out a way to apply for some scholarship funding, right, through local organizations. I was also given some financial aid. And, yeah, I was able to go to, you know, do work-study jobs. And I was very lucky. I didn't graduate with as much debt as some other people. And then, of course, I was able to go on and 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 get a six-figure job out of college. So I was able to retire that debt. I am damn lucky. <clears throat> but I look at the other side of that and the folks who don't have that. You know, I also wasn't the first in my family to go to college. And I just think we need to have this conversation and sort of this, you know, find peace with there is an economic, you know, uh, benefit for all of us, you know, to this. And some of it is just sort of, you know, recognizing that, where there is line drawing, I think you look at the numbers. You know, I understand people looked at the numbers early on. So where does this come from? The senator just laid out. This is data, folks, right? This is backed up data about what will actually make a difference and move a needle on an economic imperative that we have in this country. So I just wanted to speak to that as somebody who takes calls from thousands of, of residents around the state, you know, who we're seeing as, as the people who've been most victimized and most held back and you lay that against the context of what we've been dealing with for generations and the way the system's been set up. And there is this opportunity post COVID to rebuild, you know, new structures that are going to be more equitable and more economically powerful, I think, as we move forward. All of the professors with big six-figure salaries, but they're not teaching, they're off on sabbatical, they're working on government projects, they're writing books, students don't see them. We have a university system run by a guy who's a multi-millionaire with, with several hundred thousand in salary, all the benefits, the housing. Uh, he's going to get a huge six-figure pension. He already has a six-figure pension from his days as one of your Democratic congressional colleagues. None of you are addressing uh, reining in the cost of education. How is this debt issue ever going to be addressed if the cost of education just keeps going to the moon? Look, I'm going to say it the other way. We do need to talk about higher ed. And we need to talk about the fact that when I went to school, the taxpayer picked up virtually the entire cost of educating me. Today, that cost is shoved off onto families. And for families like mine, where I was the first in my family to graduate from college, shoving off those costs on the kid would have meant I wouldn't have gone. So this matters. It matters personally to everyone who stands on the stage. It matters personally to everyone in this room. It matters personally to every bit of opportunity for every person in this commonwealth and in this nation. So I'm all for taking on the question of how we build a higher ed system going forward, but I do not want to hold 45 million Americans hostage who are struggling with student loan debt when their sin was they tried to get a public education. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there was a report out of Blanco this morning, actually, that the president has asked his education secretary to create a memo looking into his legal authority to forgive loans or cancel the loan debt. Wanted to get your reaction to that and what steps need to happen beyond. Um, first, the, the last um, amount that it's my understanding that President Biden had proposed was ten thousand um, dollars. Well, that's great because in all the conversations that I've been a part of with impacted people, they see that $10,000 is not even interest. Um, Congress gave President Biden the authority through the Higher Education Act to cancel debt. 
Um, and so while we have introduced resolutions and legislation to get at this, um, why should the American people continue to struggle under the weight of this and wait for a legislative process when President Biden, with the stroke of a pen by executive action, authority given to him through the Higher Education Act, can immediately mitigate this hurt? And again, this is critical to a just, robust, and equitable recovery from this pandemic. This is the moment. This does jumpstart uh, the uh, economy. And it is, it's about the recovery, it's economic justice, it's racial justice, it's, it's generational justice. And these goals are all consistent with the things that have been verbally expressed by this administration um, that, they, that they want to do. Um, you know, I'm in ongoing communication with the White House um, and I'm grateful that those lines of communication uh, remain open. Um, I've been encouraged by those conversations, but I told them, listen, if you're going to uh, speak to the role that black women have played on the ballot and at the ballot box, black women are the most educated and the most burdened by mm -hmm. student debt. So you can save the words of appreciation. Policy is my love language, cancel student debt. So he has the authority and moreover, the mandate, a decisive mandate from the diverse coalition that elected him. And Jillian has one last question from the chat. That's great. Thank you. This is from Kerry Murakami, congressional reporter at the Washington Times. A big factor in the amount of student debt people owe is the cost of attending college. According to press reports, President Biden is proposing in the second phase of his infrastructure plan, making community colleges free. Do you have any indication of whether he'll also be proposing in this go around to make four years free too? If he doesn't, how disappointing would you be? <laughs> Far be it for me to speak uh, ahead of our our, uh, our members, uh, our leaders in Congress on this. I, I think, isn't this now the opportunity to do both? I mean, we're having a conversation, Mike, this goes back to your point. Here in Massachusetts, we've got a growing clean energy economy. I talked to a lot of guys, pipe fitters, you know, people working on gas pipelines and the like. Now's the time, too, to talk about what kind of training, what kind of education do we need to move us forward? And workforce development, workforce training, vocational training. We got real opportunities here. So I don't think any of this is mutually exclusive looking at the high cost of higher ed, right? I was able to get by waitressing as well in college. Looking at the high cost of higher ed, looking at the options for the kind of education that meets the job needs of, of where we're at, right? And also reckoning with the reality that for far too long, this student loan system has really disadvantaged so many. So many black and brown borrowers, white borrowers too. And now is a time where we can actually do something as proposed by this resolution that will make a meaningful and immediate difference. And wouldn't it be nice to move through this and move on to other parts of the recovery, right? I'm not worried about future bailouts or other things. We get this right, you know, then we can build forward from there. So that's- In addition to that's, giving the, what are the reforms that you propose in the student loan program? Yeah, Mike, there have been a lot of them over the years. I mean, I think a lot of it starts with Reagan. Well, I think we got to continue to do what we got to do. Look at what's what we, we, for example, you know, look at look at how veterans have been treated, okay, and used and exploited by for profit schools, you know, and uh, already we've seen some changes in, in the way in which uh, those entities are able to market and get veterans to sign up you know, for loans that we end up paying for essentially, you know, we've got to continue to crack down on predatory practices, both with the marketing of, of, of for-profit schools. And this is a space where the Congresswoman and I came to know each other on and the Senator, and I, you know, has been such a leader on. Um, and then the predatory loan, you know, servicing practices as well that, that, that happens. So I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of options there. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They've been scammed by them. Absolutely. They're going to be for-profit schools because they can't get into state schools. Well, they're going to these for-profit schools in many cases because the for-profit schools cheat them. And they spend the money to go recruit our veterans. They recruit low-income workers. Uh, with big promises that they don't deliver on. We've seen this business model over and over. Congress has just taken a step 
in reform as part of the American Recovery Act. And that is it has adjusted the 90-10 rule to say that these for-profit colleges have to be doing something more in terms of attracting students than simply bringing in student loan debt dollars. And so we have actually begun that process. Uh, the Department of Education has a lot of work in front of it in terms of student loan debt servicing and the number of people who have been put into the law, wrong repayment programs. Uh, it's a complex maze and the student loan debt servicers far too often have done what is cheapest for them, whether it was the right thing for the person who's trying to repay their loans or not. So there are a lot of places where we need to make reforms in this area. And I'm, I'm for making all of them, but we start by canceling $50,000 of student loan debt. That's what we need to do. And that's what we're calling on President Biden to do. Can I ask you a quick off the off topic question? I want to just know um, how you want to update the hate crime laws to protect Asian Americans here in Massachusetts. Well, with uh, you know forgiveness to my my, my colleagues here, um, it is an important issue, and I think all of us have spoken out about the rise of extremism, white supremacy. And, uh, and violence and hate in, in our country. And it's a real problem, it is so corrosive. And our hearts go out to the AAPI community as they've gone out to other communities. Here's what I proposed, and I am grateful to Representative Trom Nguyen and Senator Adam Hines, who co-sponsored the legislation that we filed that will make our hate crimes laws meet the moment. Number one, let's add gender to the categories of violence. Number two, let's increase the penalties for those who perpetrate hate crimes. Number three, let's move the cases from district court to superior court where more serious offenses are brought. And so those are just some ideas. Again, that's a piece of it. We need to work on the root causes of, of this hate, of this extremism, and we need to combat that. And we need to continue to work on education and training. And I am so grateful to have not only members of the community here in Massachusetts who are lifting their voices and survivors of violence and discrimination, but also the incredible delegation that we have uh, leading us in, in Washington, DC, um, who will continue to impress upon all the need to meet the moment. And, and that's uh, best, uh, I think, uh, uh, seen here in, in the words, of course, of Senator Warren time after time, and of course, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. There's been no greater voice in terms of speaking out on, on injustices and how we got here and how we go forward, how we go forward. Um, on topic, I just wanna say thank you to LaKayla. Thank you for sharing your story um, and really making you know real and personal this crisis. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. thank you for being here. Thank you.